Hi guys and welcome to my channel. My name is Bongi and you're watching True Crime with Bongi. So in today's video we're going to be talking about one of South Africa's most notorious serial killers who goes by the name Moses Sitole, also known as the ABC Killer. But before I get into this video I just want to issue out a disclaimer that I mean no disrespect to anybody that I'm going to be talking about in this video and all the families that are affected or were affected by this. And also there will be some mentions of sexual assault as well as graphic descriptions of crime scenes so if that's something that you're not into please click out of the video i completely understand and i'm pretty sure that i will see you again soon so now let's get into this video moses Sitola was born on the 17th of november 1964 in force Flores, which is a black um, township in johannesburg and he was born to sophie and simon tangawira Sitole. he was the fourth child and i think they had a total of six children together one of which was moses's stepsister i think sophie and simon had five children together and one of them was his stepsister so Sophie was a stay-at-home mom and Simon was the only breadwinner for the family. And unfortunately in 1970 when Moses was just six years old, he passed on. And because he was the only breadwinner for the family, Moses and his siblings and mom were all evicted from their home in Fort Lauderdale. So of course this was a stressful time for them. As a family and I mean considering that Sophie was just a stay-at-home mom he did she didn't know how she was gonna fend for her six children she just abandoned them at a nearby police station and told them not to tell the police that she was the mother so basically don't say anything about me don't mention me nothing so because of this, the police took the children to an orphanage in Vinoni and from this point onwards, Moses spent the most of his childhood in orphanages. When he was 11, um, he was moved from the orphanage in Vinoni and transferred to one in Kaiseren. And three years later, he escaped from the orphanage in Kaiseren and hitchhiked all the way back to Fort Lawrence to stay with his older brother, Patrick. However, this was not the first time Moses escaped from an orphanage. He had escaped before when he was eight years old. Um, he had escaped from the orphanage in Vinoni and ran all the way back to Fosloris to meet up with his mother. He was hoping for, I guess, a happy re reunion. But when he got back there, his mother sent him back to the orphanage. There was no happy ending that Moses was hoping for. So... Anyways, after some time of living together, him and Patrick, Patrick then moved to Venda and soon after this, Moses sold the house without Patrick's consent. And after that, he was just working menial jobs in farms and gold mines around Johannesburg and, you know, just kind of making ends meet. He was also a boxer, I think. I think it was like his part-time hobby. He was like a boxer building strength or whatever. And he was also apparently very good with children. He would help. Um, he would occasionally help street children and had reunited some runaways with their families. That's good, right? I guess. Uh, it was also around this time that he gained some popularity with the ladies. Um, he was known for his charm and disarming smile, but despite this charm and disarming smile, he was also known for his um, short temper. This short temper was particularly directed to women. It is said that even the slightest rejection from a woman would lead to a raging violence. Dun, dun, dun. The first time Moses acted on his impulses was in 1987 when he attacked his girlfriend's 38-year-old sister, Patricia Kumalo. He lured Patricia into a mine dump in Cleveland where he then raped her. He tied her hands with um, some items of her clothing and then put some over her face and then just left her there. But luckily, Patricia managed to escape. However, because she was scared for her life, she never reported this incident to the authorities. So that just kind of happened and then 
that was all. In 1988, a year after this um, attack, he got into a relationship with a 17-year-old girl called Spongilin Kosi. This girl was from Boxburg. And Zbongile's sister, Lindy Nkosi, was soon to become Moses' third victim. He lured her into a remote spot, threatened to pour gasoline over her and set her on fire if she didn't submit. So because she was scared, she submitted and he raped her. Once he was done, he strangled her until she lost consciousness and when she regained it, he told her that he would kill her if she ever went to the police so again like patricia she just kept quiet she didn't tell anybody and she didn't report the incident two years after his first attack in 1989 he met a woman called doris swakamisa in germiston at this time he was working as a store clerk but he told doris that he was some successful businessman from a nearby town and he promised her a job and he also offered to escort her to her new job so they walked together to a train station and when they got there he told her that they should take um, a shortcut through the veld this was not uncommon people take shortcuts through felt all the time like even today people still take shortcuts through felt so this was not uncommon at all Doris agreed and once they had walked far enough that people couldn't see or hear them, Moses pulled out a knife that he had hid with a folded newspaper under his arm and he told her that he was going to rape her. He tied her hands using her underwear and then raped her. Once he was done with this, he told her that he wouldn't kill her if she promised that she wouldn't go to the police. So, of course, like this man has a knife and he's... Like, he could kill you if you wanted to. So, Doris was like, okay, I promise I won't report you. And Moses just left her there. But three months later, Doris spotted Moses outside her new workplace. And she immediately called the police. When the police got there, they loaded both Moses and Doris at the back of a police van. I don't understand why or how they would do that. It's like they're re-victimizing her. But anyways... During the ride from this new workplace to the police station, Moses was cursing her out and even at one point said, Bitch, I should have killed you. He swore he was innocent throughout though and he truly believed he was. However, the judge saw right through him and he was sentenced to seven years imprisonment. This in his eyes was yet another betrayal from a female person because i guess she had promised not to report him and then she did because he really did believe he was innocent for some odd reason i don't know while in prison moses was not accepted by his prison mates because he was a rape convict i guess so he was an outcast however he tried to keep his cool and behave so that he would you know get out of prison sooner and on one visitor's day, he met a woman called Martha Ndlovu, who was a sister of one of the other inmates. And they then started dating. And when he was released in 1993 for good behavior, he moved in with Martha and her family at her parents' home in Pretoria. He even started working with one of Martha's brothers as a mechanic soon after moving in with them. So Moses was released in 1993 and in 1994 the apartheid governmental system was abolished. So for those of y'all who are not familiar with South African history, during apartheid many of the black South Africans were oppressed and segregated and they really didn't have that much opportunities. But once this apartheid system was abolished or done away with, Black South Africans now had more opportunities and they weren't so oppressed anymore. So many people were moving from their rural homes to Johannesburg, the big city, to find employment there. So it was around this time that Moses also kind of stopped working with um, Martha's brother and claimed that he wanted to find another job. Like he wanted to find employment 
elsewhere so because this was the time that many people were moving from their homes going to the cities and towns to find better jobs they really didn't think much of it they just thought okay he's looking for a better job so let's just let him do him you know let's just let him be so Moses would leave every morning with a folded newspaper underneath his arm and none of the family members thought much of it they just thought that he was looking for the he was gonna apply for the post on the newspapers little did they know that this was around the same time that Moses was planning his very first murder so in July 1994 only three months after the abolishment of the apartheid system Moses met a 19 year old Maria Monama on the streets of Pretoria he introduced himself as Sylvester and soon after meeting he lured her to a remote vault where he strangled her to death. Unfortunately, 19-year-old Maria Monama became Moses' very first murder victim. When Maria's body was found, it was found with a cryptic note on her leg and three messages written on her body. Now, I couldn't find whether these one of these messages that I'm about to that I'm about to read to you guys were written on the note or on her body herself but i'm assuming because most websites did mention that these three messages were on her body i'm assuming that they were on her body and not on the note and i'm assuming that there was a separate note and the three messages written on her body so these three messages one of them was and i quote she's a bitch the other one was i am no fighting with you please and the third one was, we must stay here for as long as you don't understand. It was believed that these messages were directed to the police. But then some people have the theory that um, he was trying to calm his consciousness. His, 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 his conscious? That thing that kind of haunted Macbeth? Yeah, he was kind of, <laughs> he was trying to calm it. He was trying to, you know, ease his guilt. For lack of better words he was trying to make himself feel better because he, he was trying to convince himself that he killed her because she's a bitch and she was fighting and you know he wasn't fighting and they were supposed to stay in the remote fell for as long as she did not understand what was about to happen maybe he just wanted to rape her and not kill her I really don't know but there's different theories as to who these messages were directed to is it who or whom I don't know but the correct one by the way by autumn four bodies had been found in Cleveland the fifth one in Pretoria and the sixth one in Boxburg and one of these bodies was the body of his mistress Amanda Tete whose funeral Moses attended the media was then writing about these crimes because they were so cr gruesome and they were occurring so rapidly. Um, it was said in one of the documentaries that I watched that I'm definitely going to be linking in the description box down below that the police would retrieve one body at a certain spot and two days later they would be called again to retrieve another body at the exact same spot. That's how rapid these crimes were occurring and that's how confident Moses was becoming you know confident and arrogant um yeah so the media was writing about these crimes on the 5th of november 1994 martha gave birth to a baby girl that i'm not going to be mentioning i'm not going to mention her name because i don't know I, I don't think i should i don't think i should but soon after the baby's birth martha and moses separated he was then homeless and sleeping in train stations in Pretoria, I'm thinking maybe also Johannesburg. Uh, from then on, more women's bodies were found in, at an increasing pace in Pretoria and mostly in Archerville and Boxburg, but never too far from the railway. The media then started calling these murders the ABC murders because of the initials of Archerville, Boxburg and Cleveland and he was thus dubbed the ABC killer. By July 1995, Moses had killed 18 young women and discarded their bodies outside Pretoria and Johannesburg. And after interviewing the families of these victims, the police started noticing a pattern they noticed that all these women were women who were looking for 
employment so of course the police released this to the media so that they could try to keep more women safe from becoming Moses's prey the police were also pursuing every lead but they couldn't find a name or put a face to this ABC killer and of course the women in and around these areas that the murders were taking place were very scared they they were very they were very scared because you don't know this could be somebody that you're walking past every single day and you don't know that this is the person that's killing these people because the police are not finding anything they don't know not even the name they don't know how this what this man looks like they don't know anything so you know like they were scared but they were now more cautious they were walking in groups and they weren't just leaving with anybody who promised them jobs you know with a danger who came by and promised them employment they were much more cautious and after seeing how cautious these women were becoming moses knew that he needed a new strategy so he read the newspaper every day until he finally came up with a new way to take advantage of the social reform this was when he came up with this fictitious organization called youth against human abuse um, he claimed that the mission of this organization was to reunite orphans with their families and to find homes for street children. And he needed employment, so he started drawing up job applications and handing them out to women in the streets. Now his organization or his strategies looked more legit because they had job applications and everything and he wasn't just walking up to women promising them employment and being like hey let me take you to your new workplace he wasn't doing that anymore he was gaining their trust now so in august of 1995 he got in touch with a photographer and introduced himself and his organization this time he introduced himself as moses and he introduced his his organization and told him that he needed to find a home for two homeless children <clears throat> the photographer helped him get access to a children's home called kids haven where he met a woman called trifina mohoti trifina was a single mother who supported her entire family by working at kids haven so anyways moses approached trifina offered her a hefty bonus if she would work for youth against human abuse and of course she was happy to hear this she was a single mother supporting her entire family and now she was offered a you know hefty bonus so she took the job application filled it in and gave it back to Moses who then returned the following day to inform her that her job application had been accepted they then set an appointment and Trifina was to meet him at a train station where he where he would then take her to her new job or her new workplace. Soon after that meeting, on the 15th of August, she went to meet up with Moses at the train station. And unfortunately, that would be the last time anyone ever heard from Trifina Mohut. When Trifina didn't go back home, her family became worried and her mother went to the police station to file a missing persons report. However, nobody had heard from Trifina. The last time they checked, Trifina just went to go to a job meeting. So nobody had anything and nobody knew anything about Trifina's whereabouts. One month later though, on the 17th of September, a police reservist had taken a day off to go hunt some rabbits in one of the fields in Boxburg when he suddenly was overwhelmed by the stench of decomposition. Before him laid women's bodies in different stages of decomposition so of course he was shaken up by this and he called the police. When the police got there they spread over the area and retrieved all the bodies and unfortunately Trifina Mokhoti's body was one of the 10 bodies that were found in this area. Trifina's picture had been posted on some local newspapers because she was a missing person so when police saw this they recognized her and they then located um, her workplace and they went there to you know investigate. Inspector Lionel contacted Kids Haven and through her co-workers he learned that on the day that Trifina went missing he had went to meet a man called Moses Sitole. Now Sitole is a very common name in South Africa and the police 
couldn't really do much from just the name however when they in entered Moses's name in their system they found that there had been a man called Moses Sotole who was arrested in 1989 for rape do you remember that he was arrested in 1989 for the rape of Doris Swaganisa so the police took Moses's mugshot and passed it around at Kids Haven and Esther Matlangu who was Trifina's friend and other co-workers confirmed that the man on the photo was the same man that Trifina had gone to meet before missing. The police could finally put a name and a face on the ABC killer so the search for Moses Sotole began. At around 6 o'clock on October 2nd, 1995, Moses called Johannesburg Star and introduced himself as Joseph and said that he was the man that the police were looking for. He said that he was killing out of revenge for being wrongfully convicted of rape. You remember that he genuinely believed that he was innocent, so I guess this was his revenge. And at first, the reporter he was talking to he thought that he was a hoax. But he was given very graphic descriptions of the murders, some of which had not even been released by the police. So the reporter, Tamsin De Beer, contacted the police and told them about these conversations that she was having with this Joseph guy. And even gave them the transcripts because as they were having a conversation, she was kind of typing down everything that this guy was saying. But the police didn't believe, they weren't convinced that she was actually talking to the real guy. So the next time he called, she asked him to prove that he was the so-called serial killer. Moses then told her of the location of an old body that the police hadn't found. It was a, a murder that he had committed way back. Um, he described the conditions of that body because he had actually recently went back to the crime scene and he found that the police had not discovered the body and it was still in the same exact position that he had left it. So he described the positions and conditions of that body and when the police retrieved this body they confirmed that it could be possible that Tamsin De Beer was talking to Moses on the phone. He then described and gave the location of yet another body and the police went and found that body and this was the body of his latest victim, a 31 year old woman who had disappeared the previous day. On October 13th, a photo of Moses was published on the front page of newspapers and on the TV in Johannesburg and Pretoria. And a few days later, Moses got in touch with his brother-in-law, Maxwell Makabani, and told him that he needed a gun. Maxwell agreed that he would help him get a gun and arranged for them to meet at the factory where he worked at. Um, and immediately after this call, Maxwell called the police and told them everything that was being said through and during that phone call. So on the day that they were supposed to meet, there was an undercover police officer acting as a security guard at this factory. There were two security guards. One of them was a, this undercover police officer and one of them was a completely clueless um, a security guard who believed that this other security guard who was an undercover cop was actually a rookie at the job. So when Moses told when so when Moses got there he told them who he was looking for and the security guard told the police officer to go get Maxwell. However, when this police officer refused, Moses sensed that this could be a setup and he just started running. The police officers who were surrounding the place and this undercover cop chased after him. Um, the undercover cop I couldn't find his name, I'm so sorry, but, but he's just going to be referred to as the undercover cop on this video. So this undercover cop fired a couple of warning shots and suddenly Moses swung at him because he was like right behind him, he swung at him using an axe and in response this police officer shot him in the leg and abdomen and he was down. He was then taken to the hospital because he was in a critical condition. At the hospital, Moses was barely responding to the questions that he was being asked. Like the police would ask him, did we find all the bodies? And he'd be like, 
I don't know, I wasn't with you. You know, he was being arrogant and he wasn't responding to any of their questions. But that was until a female police officer was brought in. When this female police officer was brought in, it is said that Moses was actually quite excited. He was bragging about his crimes. He described his crimes in great detail and he even appeared to be aroused by these murders and even went as far as masturbating as he was describing his crimes to her. When he was asked why he did it, he said it was to teach them a lesson. When he recovered from his wounds, he was transferred to a prison near Pretoria to await his trial. And while he was there, he agreed to um, give a recorded interview to an inmate under the premise that it would be sold and that the be his benefits would go to his daughter, the one that he had with Martha. Um, and in this interview, Moses admitted to 29 murders and said that he didn't know where the other nine came from. According to him, he got his thrill from seeing his victim's eyes bulge out as they died, and he would also masturbate as they died. At his trial, however, he pleaded not guilty to all the charges and accused the police of forcing him to confess. But the DNA found at the scenes, plus the witnesses, plus the jailhouse confessions, all linked him to the murders and on December 4th, 1997, he was found guilty of 38 counts of murder, 40 counts of rape and 6 counts of robbery and was subsequently sentenced to 2,410 years in prison with no possibility of parole for 930 years. So I guess we can say he's gonna be in there forever because he's definitely not gonna be alive for 930 years. So he's not gonna be eligible for parole anytime soon. He is currently serving his sentence in the CMEX section of Pretoria Central Prison, which is the highest security block in South Africa. So that brings us to the end of today's video. If you enjoyed this video or found this video informative, please leave a thumbs up button and also subscribe to my channel and click on the notification bell to get notified each time I post a new upload. And I'll see you guys next week, Friday. Please stay safe, stay kind, stay beautiful. Bye. Bye. Thank you.